Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, ma ba'd, a'udhu billahi samir li min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, fa waylul li ladhina yaktubun al-kitaba bi-aydihim, thumma yaquluna haza min indillah, li yashtaru bihi thamanan qalila, fa waylullah, fa waylullahum mimma katabat aydihim, wa waylullahum mimma yaksibun. وقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بلغ عني ولو آية. Respected brothers and sisters in Islam and dear friends, I am honoured to be here today and I am very thankful to Sheikh uh, Abdul Rahim Makathi and his team for allowing me to address you on this very important topic. What is the topic today? Without uh, further ado, I'll get straight into the topic. The topic is the Muslim view on the Bible. The Bible is a phenomenon. It is a very, very powerful text. It is an ancient text and uh, almost 2 billion people on the planet believe in it. And a lot of people believe in it as the inerrant word of God. A lot of people. When I say a lot of people, I mean uh, the overwhelming majority of Catholics, Protestants and Orthodox Christians. Collectively, they make nearly 2 billion people in the world. And that's a lot of people. They believe in the Bible as the inerrant word of God. In other words, the Bible is without errors and it is the literal word of God. It is God revealed, God inspired. This is what the Christians believe in. Now, the Quran was revealed on the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Muslims around the world, who may be about 1.5 billion people in the world uh, to have a conservative estimate, these 1.5 billion people, they believe in the Quran as the word of God, as the literal word of God, uncorrupted, unchanged, unaltered, authentic word of God in the language God revealed it to his prophet uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is the Muslim belief. Now, in the Quran, we are told that the Jewish and the Christian scriptures are not pure. They are not entirely authentic. They are corrupted. This is what the Quran tells us. And in other places, the Quran appears to be telling us to question the people of the book. In other words question the Jews and the Christians about the scriptures or tell the Jews and the Christians to judge by the books that were revealed upon them. And some of these verses actually confuse a lot of non-Muslims into thinking that in one place the Quran is saying that the scriptures of the Jews and the Christians have been corrupted, altered, changed beyond recognition, beyond repair. And in another place, the Quran uh, appears to be telling us that we ought to follow the scriptures. Uh, in other words, the Jews and the Christians ought to follow the scripture. So what is the context? What is the meaning of the Quran in this sense? That's why this topic is very important. What is the actual, authentic, dominant view of the Muslims on the Bible? What do the Muslims think of the Bible? Now, there are many Christian masses, as I highlighted earlier, they believe in the Bible as the inerrant word of God. But that does not include Christian and Jewish scholars. This is a very important distinction we must understand. Christian and Jewish academics are very, very adamant that the scriptures we have in our hands today, attributed to Old Testament personalities, are not authentic. They are not the actual word that was written down by those prophets. Or the scribes, even the scribes who wrote those scriptures down in the early period of the formation of these scriptures, we do not have those originals. The Jewish people will tell you that and the Christians will tell you that. How do I know that? So before I get, get into these details, I want to quickly address the, the Muslim view on the Bible, okay? The Muslim view on the Bible is basically what I said earlier, that the Muslims believe the Bible 
is changed. It is altered, like many Christians and Jewish scholars uh, who believe that the Bible is altered, it's changed. It is not in its original form, but the masses believe something else. The Christian and Jewish masses may not be aware of the intricate details of the canonization, the compilation, the, the collection of the books that can be found in the Bible today. The Bible is a collection of 66 books if we are looking at the Protestant Bible and 73 books if we are looking at the Catholic Bible. Okay, so the Catholics have uh, seven, uh, about seven extra books while the Protestants, they enjoy 66 books in their canon, right? So both groups actually differ as to the exact nature of the word of God. Okay, now that aside, put that aside for a second. They are unanimous on 66 books. The Catholics and the Protestants are unanimous on 66, book, uh, 66 books. They all believe that these 66 books, 27 in the New Testament and 39 in the Old Testament. 39 books of the Old Testament and 30, uh, sorry, 27 books of the, the New Testament are all scripture to the Catholics as well as the Protestants. While Protestants reject seven books from the canon, they take, they, they omit seven books from the canon. Having clarified this, still the masses believe that the books are from God. They were inspired by God. But the details are only known to the scholars, the Jewish and the Christian scholars. And the, there, there are books the Jewish and Christian scholars have written in this regard to highlight the problem of the scripture. They themselves highlight that the Bible is not preserved. It is not original. When they say it is not original, they mean the Bible, the, 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 the books of the Bible attributed to, let's say, Moses. Five books of the, uh, the Old Testament. The first five books of the Old Testament, collectively called the Pentateuch, are attributed to Moses. Jewish scholars tell us that these books are actually not the word of Moses. These books are based upon the translations, which were made very, very, very late from earlier scriptures that actually originated from Moses. This is a very simplified way of putting the view of the Jewish people on the scripture, right? So how do they know this? Because no one knows to this day as to what language Moses spoke. No one knows. No one in the world can claim to know as to the language of Moses. No one knows. If that's the case, then how do we know what Moses had transcribed as scripture for the Israelites? We have no copies from Moses. We have nothing close to the time of Moses. We have nothing close to even five centuries after Moses. What we do have, the oldest scriptures of the Old Testament, the oldest manuscripts of the Old Testament we have are called the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they come from uh, about the first century BC. Okay. And Moses was alive during the New Kingdom in Egypt. That could be anywhere between 1500 to 1300 BC. Anywhere between 1500 to even 1200 BC, some people say. If Ramses II was the Pharaoh of Moses, then we are looking at anywhere between 1500 to 1300 BC. Now that's a huge gap between Moses and the oldest manuscripts of the Old Testament. So these five books called the Torah or the Pentateuch cannot possibly have come from Moses. These are the works of later rabbis who had copied from copies of the copies of the copies of the copies, of the copies uh, keep going back all the way to the time of Moses. So we have actually lost the words of Moses. Whatever Moses spoke to his people in whatever language, we have no trace of it, absolutely not. So what we may have in the Old Testament are remnants of the original scripture, which came to Moses. Similarly, the New Testament is very similar in this regard. No scholar 
no Christian scholar, I'm not talking about the masses. The masses are not aware of the details. They're not aware of history. They don't know how the scriptures were canonized, how they were put together, what was the process that uh, brought the, the scripture to them. The masses are unaware. We're talking about scholars. Christian scholars around the world uh, have no idea as to the language of Jesus. They don't know what language exactly Jesus spoke. He clearly didn't speak Greek. Greek was not the language of Jesus. If anyone claims that, they have to present evidence and there is no evidence whatsoever. Uh, some people estimate that Jesus spoke a dialect of Aramaic, okay? And they don't know which dialect he spoke. In other words, we don't have even the words of Jesus Christ, let alone Moses, who lived almost 1,000, 500 years before Jesus Christ, okay? So we don't have the words of Jesus Christ. The oldest manuscripts we have of the Old Testament are in the Greek language, and Jesus did not speak Greek. So clearly, someone heard the words of Jesus Christ, and then those words were translated into the Greek language, and then those works were disseminated, and then some authors, anonymous authors, anonymous authors wrote these works later on and then the names were given to these documents uh, in particular the four gospels the names were given to them in the late second century by the way this may come as a shock this information come may come as a shock to most of you but i'm not making this up this is all based upon christian and jewish scholarship judeo-christian scholarship will tell you that this is what the case is if anyone wants to take me up on that if, any, any, if anyone wants to challenge me on these things I have already said, uh, then please do so, and I will present you with the evidence, right? So this is very, very clear in the very beginning. This is what the Jews and Christian scholars, this is what the Jewish and Christian scholars think of their scriptures, those who are learned, those who have studied in depth. So what is the Muslim view, Muslim scholarly view on the Bible? What do the Muslims think? Muslims pretty much confirm Muslim scholars pretty much confirm the findings of the Jewish and Christian scholars. So the views I have presented in front of you already, uh, as far as the Jewish and Christian scholars are concerned, the Muslim scholars are no different based upon what the Quran tells them, what the Prophet told them, and whatever they found themselves later on through their own research. So let's get cracking with the Quran. What does the Quran have to say on this topic? Okay, the Quran has a number of verses on the authenticity or the preservation or the validity of the biblical text, uh, the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. So in chapter 2, verse 79 of the Quran, Surah Baqarah, verse 79, Allah tells us, the Muslims, and I've read the verse already, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Therefore, woe be unto those who write the book with their, their hands and then say, this is from Allah, that they may purchase a small gain therewith. Woe unto them for that their hands have written and woe unto them for that they earn thereby. In other words, Allah is telling us that some Israelite scribes had written books with their own hands, and then they presented those books as the word of Allah. Woe be unto what they did. Woe be unto what they wrote. Woe be unto what they earned from it. So there were certain people, scribes in particular. Now, why talking about these people? Because uh, not everybody could be a scribe in Israel. In the history of uh, Israelites, not every Tom, Dick, or George, let's say, okay, could be um, a scribe. Scribes were specifically chosen due to their family lineage and their characters and their characteristics and the qualities. And then they were given the task to write the scripture. So, what all Allah is saying in the Quran that those Israelites who had written the scripture for the Israelites, and then they claim this is from Allah, 
they were simply a bunch of liars. They were lying, okay? Because woe be unto what they wrote, woe be unto what they earned uh, from it by writing it. So this is one of, uh, one of the very clear verses in the Quran, categorical verses on this matter, that the scriptures of the Israelites are not original. They were written by certain scribes, and those scribes attributed these scriptures to God Almighty. Okay, then there is another verse in chapter 4, verse 157. Now, that was the first verse from 279, chapter 2, verse 79 of the Quran is about, specifically speaking, the Israelites. Then there is a verse in the Quran about the New Testament also, because the New Testament was copied, penned, transcribed in a completely different way to what the Israelite scribes are doing, right? So we have something on the New Testament as well. In chapter 4 of the Quran, Surah An-Nisa, verse 157, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Muslims, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa qawlihim, inna qatalna al-Masih, Isa ibn Maryam, Rasulullah, wa ma qataluhu, wa ma salabuhu, wa la kin shubbeha lahum, wa inna al-ladhina akhtalafu, fihi lafi shakim minhu, ma lam bihi min ilm illa attiba'i al-dhan, so the translation is, and they're saying, who? The Israelites. As for the Israelites saying, surely we have killed the Messiah, Isa, son of Mary, the apostle of God. Okay, and they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but it appeared to them so. And most surely, those who differ therein are only in a doubt about it. They have no knowledge respecting it, but only follow a conjecture and they killed him not for sure. So here, the God of Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not that there is another God besides him, but when I say the God of Islam or the one who revealed the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells the believers, the Muslims and the world that those who claim to have killed Jesus Christ are simply mistaken, okay? Jesus was not killed. He was not crucified, okay? But something like this appeared to them so, and they are in doubt. They are in, in uh, you know, they are indifferent about it, and they are in doubt, and they follow nothing but conjecture. He was not killed, certainly. He was not killed, certainly. Okay, so in other words, what Allah is telling us in this verse is that the four Gospels are simply wrong. When the four Gospels give us the story that Jesus Christ was killed on the cross, they are simply mistaken. Okay, they are following nothing but conjecture, hearsay, rumors. This is what the Quran is basically, uh, in not so many words, telling us. How do I know this? How am I making these claims? Because the Quran says, It appeared to them. So they thought, they thought, they thought this is what happened. Clearly, that is the case because this is what the gospel authors are writing. So the Quran is actually acknowledging that the gospel authors actually thought this is what happened. And they started to write this narrative, copying from each other. And this is another question now altogether. Did the gospel authors copy from each other? In fact, the gospel authors copied from each other verbatim, in some places, word by word, word by word. And this is what we call uh, the synoptic problem, the synoptic tradition. Three gospels borrowed from each other, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John borrowed from each other, right? And the gospel of John is an odd one out, which is uh, a slightly different tradition altogether. So why am I telling you all these things? So that you are clear on the Muslim view from the very start that the Quran is telling us that the four Gospels, when they say that Jesus Christ was crucified, are mistaken. He was not killed. He was not crucified. And the Quran also claims that those who are saying this are differing with each other. They are giving different information, right? Because when we read the Quran, and I read the translation, and most surely those who differ therein are only in doubt. Who are the ones who are differing with each other? Those who differ, who are they? Who is the Quran talking about? The gospel authors, clearly. 
they're the ones who are uh, differing with each other on the matter of crucifixion. How? When you look at the details of the matter of crucifixion in the four gospels, you find variations, you find mathematical contradictions. How can one God reveal one incident to four different authors in different, uh, with different details? How is that possible? What games is God playing is the question. What games is God playing? If God is responsible, if Allah is responsible for revealing uh, the information uh, four gospel authors had put down in their respective gospels, then why is God revealing different information to them about the same incident? Not one of the gospels agree in all particulars with each other when it comes to the matter of crucifixion. So Allah is making it very clear that they differ with each other you know, in these details, they're not even unanimous as to what exactly were the details when it came to crucifixion. Was the tomb empty or was there was someone in the tomb? Okay. Was the stone lifted or was it not? When did women actually arrive at the tomb? Okay. When was the anointment done? All of these questions are very important and gospel records disagree with each other. That's why the Quran makes the next point. They follow nothing but conjecture. They follow hearsay. They just heard something and they started to document it. They killed him not for sure. So this is a very categorical statement in the Quran. Basically uh, disagreeing with the four gospels that, you know, four gospels are simply following conjecture, following doubt, and they're not sure about it. They are in uh, differences with each other. And therefore, they are not authentic. They, are, they cannot possibly be from God. They cannot possibly be from God because they don't even agree with each other in all details, let alone with the Quran. How can, they, how can the Gospel of Luke be from God and then the Gospel of Mark is differing with the, the Gospel of Luke on the same issue? How can the Gospel of Matthew be from God if... Uh, let's say Gospel of Mark is uh, uh, differing with it in, uh, in details. How is that even possible? Does that even make sense? Right? So clearly, three different people were writing different things in their respective documents and then they started to attribute these things to God. Later on, people did. Actually, those authors did not. They are free from what later people did. Um, so later on, some church fathers started to call the works of these four gospel authors scripture. They are the ones who gave uh, the status of scripture to these documents. In the first uh, and the second century, in the, late, in the late first and the second century, these documents were simply called the memoirs of the apostles. They were not given the status of scripture by the Christian church fathers. It was only in the third century when some church fathers started to refer to the New Testament books in general and four gospels in particular as scripture. So initially, these books were not even called scripture by Christians themselves. Moving on, what did the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and his companions say about this issue? We have a narration in Sahih al-Bukhari the most authentic book after the Quran in Islam is Sahih al-Bukhari. Okay. And we have uh, Hadith number 613, volume 9, book 93. Uh, this is a Hadith from Ibn Abbas, a cousin of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, how can you ask the people of the scriptures, in other words, the Jews and the Christians, about their books? While you have Allah's book, the Quran, which is the most recent of the books revealed by Allah, and you read it in its pure, undistorted form. This shows us some understanding of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad about the status of the Jewish and the Christian scripture. We continue. There's another hadith, the very next hadith, hadith number 614, volume 9, book 93. Narrated, narrated by Ubaidullah bin Abdullah. He states, Abdullah bin Abbas said, Oh, the group of Muslims, how can you ask the people of the scriptures about anything while your book which Allah has revealed to your prophet contains the most recent news from Allah 
and is pure, and not distorted. Allah has told you that the people of the scriptures have changed some of Allah's books and distorted it and wrote something with their own hands and said, this is from Allah, so as to have a minor gain from it. Won't the knowledge that has come to you stop you from asking them? No. By Allah, we have never seen a man from them asking you about that, the book of Al-Quran, which has been revealed to you. So Abdullah bin Abbas, the very cousin of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is reported to have said these things, that how can you possibly, talking to Muslims, how can you possibly go to the Israelites and the Christians, asking them about their scriptures, while they are not in a pure form, they have been distorted. And the Quran is with you, which is undistorted, which has been revealed by Allah. So he's telling the Muslims not to go to take any inspiration from the Bible necessarily. Why? Because the Bible is corrupted. It is distorted. The Quran isn't. Therefore, you have no reasons to go to speak to the Jewish and the Christian people on religious matters. On religious matters in particular, do not take any guidance from the scriptures because their scriptures are not pure. This is what the meaning is. Okay. Now, similarly, uh, there is another hadith in book uh, 61 of Sahih al-Bukhari, volume 6, hadith number 510, book 61. Anas bin Malik, another companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallam, narrates that Hudayfa bin Yaman came to Uthman at the time when the people of Sham and the people of Iraq were waging war to conquer Armenia and Azerbaijan. Hudayfa was afraid of the differences in the recitation of the Quran, so he said to Uthman, O chief of the believers, save this nation before they differ about the book as the Jews and the Christians did before us. So Uthman sent a message to Hafsa saying, send us the manuscript of the Quran so that we may compile the Quranic materials in perfect copies and return the manuscripts to you. Hafsa sent it to Uthman. Uthman then ordered Zaid bin Thabit, Abdullah bin Zubair, Saeed bin Al-As, and Abdurrahman bin Harith bin Hisham to write the manuscripts in perfect copies. Uthman said to three Qurayshi men, in case you disagree with Zaid bin Thabit on any point in the Quran, then write it in the dialect of Quraysh. Uh, the Quran was revealed in their tongue. They did so, and when they had written many copies, Uthman returned the original manuscripts to Hafsa. Uthman sent to every Muslim province one copy of what they had copied and ordered that all the other Quranic materials, whether written in uh, fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, be burnt. Said bin Thabit added, a verse from Surah Ahzab was missed by me, uh, Zaid bin Thabit rather, uh, Zaid bin Thabit added, a verse from Surah Ahzab was missed by me when uh, we copied the Quran and I used to hear Allah's Apostle reciting it. So we searched for it and found it with Huzema bin Thabit al-Ansari. And that verse was, among the believers are men who have been true in their covenant with Allah. Surah 33, verse 23. So what is this hadith telling us? This hadith is telling us that the people of Syria and the people of Iraq, new Muslims, who are reading the Quran uh, and pronouncing it differently, differently to each other because they were taught in different modes. And these variations were causing problems. So Hudayfa bin Yaman came to Uthman an, and he gave him an example of the Jewish and the Christian people before us. The Jewish and the Christian people, they differed about the scripture before us. Okay, they lost the scripture. We cannot do so. Therefore, we need to standardize the text of the Quran. And these were the companions of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the very authorities who learned the Quran directly from the Prophet. They knew exactly what the Quran is and how to write it. Okay, Zaid bin Thabit was one of those people who learned the Quran directly from the Prophet among others, right? So the point here is that they knew the scriptures of the Jews and the Christians had been corrupted, altered, changed due to similar differences. Uh, so we cannot afford these differences. That, that's why we need to put the Quran down in one dialect, the Qureshi dialect, the Qureshi language, for example, because the Quran was originally revealed in the dialect of Quraysh. Of course, there were other modes of reading the Quran in other tribal dialects, which some of the Arabs did, and those dialects were then taught to 
the people of Syria, the people of Iraq, and they kept reading the Quran in the very dialects they were taught in, and therefore some uh, variations occurred due to these dialects. And that's why Hudayfa bin Jaman came to Uthman, the leader of the believers, the ruler of the Muslims at the time, that we need to standardize the text of the Quran in the Qurayshi dialect so that these uh, variations do not occur again. And the purpose was to preserve the word of Allah before we lose it, before we lose it. That was the point. And that's why they did it. So Uthman radiallahu an, he standardized with the supervision of those four companions I mentioned in the report. Uh, with the help of these four companions, the text of the Quran was actually standardized based upon the instructions of the Prophet ﷺ himself. And then these copies have remained static. I repeat, these copies made by Uthman radiallahu an, and sent to different provinces of the Muslim world, they remained static to this day. You open a Quran, in any mosque around the world, and you open the copy from the first century that we can find around the world in global libraries, in museums, you read a Quran from the first century, uh, the text that was standardized by Uthman and his committee, it is exactly the same as what we read in, in our modern copies today. No biblical scholar, no Jewish scholar can claim that about their scriptures. If you do a comparison with the Greek manuscripts, the earliest ones, with those that were compiled today or edited today, they are completely, I mean, they're not completely different, of course, but there are very, very strong differences. And these differences run in tens of thousands, tens of thousands. Am I making this up? Absolutely not. You can find details in a book titled The Text of the New Testament, its uh, revelation, uh, uh, sorry, it's, uh, it's reception, uh, uh, corruption, and restoration. It's reception, corruption, and restoration. The book was authored by Bruce Metzger and later on co-authored by uh, Bart Ehrman. These two scholars, one of them Christian, Bruce Metzger was a Christian scholar. They basically acknowledged that the, the text of the New Testament was received. It was corrupted beyond repair, and now it is being restored, okay? So this is what uh, the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu understood from their experience. Now, what do the scholars of Islam have to say about the corruption of the, the previous scriptures? What do the scholars of Islam have to say about this? I wanna, I'm gonna very quickly address this point. Uh, we have the commentary of Imam Ibn Jarir al-Tabri, Okay, on um, chapter 2, verse 79, Surah Baqarah, verse 79, the verse which I have already read earlier, okay, Imam At-Tabri, he states uh, about this verse, when explaining it in his commentary, he says, what is meant by this? It is referring to those who distorted the book of Allah from the Jews of Bani Israel, and they wrote a book on which they put their interpretations in opposition to that which were revealed by Allah to his prophet Moses, peace be upon him, then they sold it to a people who have no knowledge of what is in it, nor what is in the Torah, and are ignorant of what is in the books of Allah in order to gain worthless materialistic benefits. Okay, this is from uh, the commentary of Imam Ibn Jarid al-Tabri on chapter 2, verse 79. And then in another place, while commenting on chapter 5 of the Quran, verse 13, Again, same great scholar of Tafsir, Imam Tabri states, they distort the speech of their Lord, which he sent down to their prophet Moses, people upon him, and that is the Torah. They substitute it and write from their own hands other than what Allah has revealed to their prophet. And they say to the ignorant ones of the people, this is the speech of Allah that he sent down to his prophet Moses, people upon him. And the Torah that he revealed to him. This is exactly what happened. This is exactly what happened. Some people wrote these books, attributed uh, attributed these books to the prophets of Allah and by extension to Allah. And then ignorant people accepted uh, these, these, uh, these scriptures as if they were actually revealed by God Almighty. And that wasn't true. Then we have other scholars uh, like Ibn Hazm, 
uh, who died in 456 Hijri, he said in his book, uh, Al Fasl uh, Fil Milal Wan uh, Okay, he, uh, in volume two, page two, he states, we do not need to try hard to that the gospel and all the books of the Christians did not come from God or from the Messiah, peace be upon him, in other words, Jesus, as we needed to do with regard to the Torah and the books attributed to the prophets that the Jewish people have. Because the Jewish claim that the Torah that they have was revealed from God to Moses, uh, so we needed to establish proof that this claim of theirs is false. With regards to the Christians, they have taken care of the issue themselves because they do not believe that the Gospels were revealed from God to the Messiah or that the Messiah brought them. Rather, all of them, from first to last, peasants and kings, Nestorians, Jacobites, Maronites, and Orthodox are all agreed that there are four historical accounts written by four known men at different times. The first of them is the account written by Matthew, the Levite, who was a disciple of the Messiah, nine years after the Messiah was taken up into heaven. He wrote it in Hebrew, in Judea, in Palestine, and it filled uh, approximately 28 pages in a medium-sized script. The next account was written by Mark, a disciple of Simon uh, ben Jonah, uh, who was called Peter. Okay, 22 years after the Messiah was taken up into heaven. He wrote it in Greek, in Antioch, in the land of the Byzantines. They say, that the, Simon men that the Simon mentioned is the one who wrote it. And then he erased his name from the beginning of it and attributed it to his disciple Mark. It filled 24 pages written in medium size script. This, this Simon was a disciple of the Messiah. The third account written was that of Luke, a physician of Antioch, who was also a disciple of Simon Peter, who wrote it in Greek after Mark had written his account and is similar to length, a uh, similar in length to the Gospel of Matthew. The fourth account was written by John, the son of Zebedee, another disciple of the Messiah, 60 odd years after the Messiah had been taken up into heaven. He wrote it in Greek and it filled 24 pages in a medium sized script. So Ibn Hazm is simply quoting the Christians because he says in the beginning of this very paragraph that the Christians have taken care of this problem themselves. And this is what the Christians say about the history of the scriptures. And none of this, by the way, the modern scholarship uh, today we have has shown us none of these claims Ibn Hazm borrowed from the Christians themselves can be proved today. There is no evidence whatsoever whether, uh, let's say, Mark was a disciple of Peter, whether Luke was a physician of Paul, whether uh, Matthew was a Levite. Okay, whether John, the son of Zebedee, is the actual candidate who wrote the Gospel of John, the fourth Gospel. Ibn Hazm, a thousand years ago, was simply quoting what the Christians had written in their books. He was in Spain, he was very advanced, he knew a number of different languages. He had clearly read the works written by Christians on this matter and had put down uh, what they had said. So Ibn Hazm also is making the same point that the Christians are telling us that these works are not from the Messiah. They didn't come from Jesus Christ. Rather, later people, even according to the Christians, wrote these works and attributed these words to Jesus Christ. Then what does Ibn Taymiyyah, one of the greatest theologians to have lived in the history of Islam, okay, during the Middle Ages, uh, very soon after the Mongol invasions, he was born in Haran in current day, uh, Turkey, and he grew up in Damascus. He was a great scholar of Islam, Sheikh al Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah. He said, when commenting on the same issue, with regards, with regards to the Gospels that the Christians have, there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are agreed that Luke and Mark did not see the Messiah. Rather, he's, he was seen by Matthew and John. These four accounts that they call the Gospels and they call each one of them a gospel, were written by these men after the Messiah had been taken up into heaven. They did not say that they are the word of God, okay, or that the Messiah conveyed them from God, rather they narrated some of the words of the Messiah and some of his deeds and miracles. So the point Ibn Taymiyyah is making, again, quoting the Christians, that 
they did not claim, these authors did not claim they were writing for God, rather they wrote what they thought happened to the Messiah or what they heard uh, from people around them, what happened to the Messiah. Similar things have been said by other commentators uh, like Ibn Kathir, uh, who also said the same thing. So in a nutshell, uh, what is the Muslim view on the Bible to summarize again? The Muslim view on the Bible is that the Bible is corrupted because the Quran states that very categorically. And the, the scriptures, the Jewish and the Christian people have their hands today are not original scriptures given to those prophets they are attributed to. So for that reason, these scriptures cannot be trusted. But at the same time, we have to be wary of throwing away baby with the, baby with the bathwater. We don't believe in that. We're not extremists. We do know, there is no doubt, that there are correct, authentic passages in translation, not in the words of those prophets, have survived to this day in those scriptures. So I will repeat, we as Muslims do believe, and this was the view of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, that all the Bible is corrupted and not all of it is authentic. There is false information. There are attributions, false attributions or attributions that cannot be proven. They are there. And at the same time, there is authentic information which has origin in once upon a time uh, revelation of Allah to his prophets. Okay, so this is the Muslim view, but we do not have the actual words of Moses and the actual words of Jesus, just like we have with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Quran is exactly what he taught his companions. Okay, the Quran is exactly what he taught his companions and we have exactly the same Quran with us today because it were his companions who standardized the text of the Quran and transcribed it uh, based upon the instructions of the Prophet for us, and therefore we have our Quran today, word by word. Every single word of the Quran comes directly from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was given this text by Allah. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala revealed the Quran upon the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this is what our belief is about the Quran: that it is preserved word by word, not a word has come from someone else. There is no evidence that anyone else added a word into the Quran. The Christians and the Jews cannot claim that about the scriptures. But we are very, very fair people. We do justice to the Christians and the Jewish friends, and we accept what agrees with the Quran in the scriptures. And there's a lot that agrees. You know why? Because we do believe the origin of the scriptures of the Jews and Christians is eventually from God. Uh, these attributions uh, are true. They are uh, uh, correct. But uh, what we find in the name of these attributions in the Bible is not entirely correct. Because we have the words of scribes, we have the words of historians, we have the words of poets. Uh, attributed to scholars and great personalities that we cannot actually prove okay so the muslim view again uh, to summarize the whole thing is that we believe the words or the scriptures of the jews and the christians are corrupted distorted altered changed okay but at the same time we also believe there is truth therein there is definitely truth that has to be found using external criteria and one of them is the Quran. We can use the Quran because we believe the Quran to be the word of God. We believe it is authentic. It is definitely revealed by God. We can use the Quran as Muslims to see what may have been revealed by God. As for others, they can use their own criteria to find out historic and religiously interesting uh, information from the Bible. And I will stop there. I, have, uh, I hope I have clarified uh, the, the topic in detail. And I hope uh, it wasn't very complicated. If there are any questions, uh, please put them forward. I'll be happy to answer your questions. And uh, inshallah, I can even present evidence uh, um, to substantiate my points. Thank you so much for listening. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.